Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Garrisonovich, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, I got my dog a frisbee, but it sits flat on the floor. So when he goes to retrieve it, he has to sit there for five minutes pawing at it like a, <laughs> like a fool, uh, trying, trying to pick it up, and it is immensely entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, that's, you know, it's all about finding entertainment where you can. Yep. Uh, I'm... Cameron Lalana, and <laughs> so the, the last night I was actually I was at a bar with some friends of mine, and uh, I was at, sitting at the kind of the edge of the bar counter where there was like this little several bowls on kind of like a fancy I don't know holder with with candy in them. And there was this old guy sitting kind of at, at the other at the like, kitty corner to me at this bar, uh, and whenever a woman came up to grab a piece of candy, he would go. So what's your favorite kind of candy? And, and roughly that tone of voice. And like, I don't know how I, I, I wanted to take him aside and be like, hey, my guy, first of all, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you about like trying to I, I'm not here to tell you how you how you try to start a conversation in a bar. But uh, what's your favorite kind of candy is just about the worst opener I can imagine. Second, only to, hey, do you want to go back to my place and look at my knife collection? And also don't <laughs> tell your friends where you're going. Uh, did he have any quests to offer? Was he was he a good bar NPC? Do you think I wanted to start a conversation with the hey, what's your favorite kind of candy guy? Well, maybe you don't know what kind of gear he had. Like, you know, what about the XP gain, Cameron? I I didn't I didn't think about that. How are you supposed? <laughs> how are you and your party supposed to start your quest? <laughs> That's a good point. That's a really good point. Well, next time, think. Next time, next time, <laughs> keep an eye out for him. Yeah, ask him that question. Yeah, you should. Well. This is a podcast where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're fulfilling our promise to become a socialist realist podcast and kicking off our next series, which over the next 10 episodes, we're going to be covering Stalingrad by Vasily Grossman. Uh, Cameron said, Matt, you can describe what Stalingrad is. <laughs> and I came up with two in my head. I said it's about love life and everything in between and it is also the <laughs> counterpoint to the argument that the soviet union produced no good art which is objectively a stupid thing to say as we will kind of unpack in this first episode and the next nine episodes absolutely uh yeah stalingrad uh, god i am so excited for this i was <laughs> i'm kind of a you know i know like world war ii guys is like an archetype for like uh, early 20s people or but God, I love I love learning about World War II. I, I grew up on I was when I was a kid, I was literally only allowed to watch PBS and the History Channel. So I pretty much grew up on World War II documentaries. <laughs> and um, for whatever reason, as part of my my IR, my international relations degree at Davis, I had to take a ton of World War II classes, uh, which was with uh, with a lot with Eric Reichway and some uh, tangentially with Dr. Olmsted. So I'm I'm really excited to get into and you finally use some of that knowledge for for talking about Stalingrad. He's been waiting for years. The floodgates have been opened. <laughs> we can't escape. None of you can escape <laughs> my horrible little facts about this, this this conflict. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited. It's my first time reading Stalingrad. So it's gonna be I guess any Cameron, it's gonna be fun because a lot of the stuff that I read for the podcast, it's my I don't even know what time reading it is. It's been a lot of times. So it's yep. kind of nice to have the the journey of fresh discovery publicly so when i say some dumb stuff people can come into our discord and roast me it'll be great <laughs> we'll leave the discord link in the show notes so you can go in and roast matt who will be the only one getting things wrong in this podcast yes naturally yes, naturally uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh before we get into that proper matt i gotta ask uh, we're, we're kicking off such a monumental series so what have you brought to the table today to drink okay i, I know people are not going to like this because uh, people oh don't boy. like when right. i do things like this but so tonight i'm drinking it and i'm standing by it i'm drinking a whiskey called howler head okay which is a whiskey with natural banana flavor and i'm not gonna <laughs> lie it's actually pretty good i picked it up because okay. i said it's got a monkey on the cover it's got to be okay <laughs> and it was it was and when you say natural banana flavor, do you mean that in the sense that it's like made with bananas or that it's natural in the sense that banana is a flavor that exists in the world? And so they can legally call it that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to assume the first one, like there were bananas <laughs> somehow involved in this brewing process. Okay. I don't know. And I didn't care enough to research it because it tastes good. 
So if you like banana, you know, if you like banana, that's that that's probably kind of a necessary prerequisite. Sure, yeah. What what did you bring to this fine this fine podcast? I have I have a so this is called Cryostash. It's an Imperial IPA uh, made by Hop Valley from their I, I assume this is like a line cryo hops, which somehow uh, cryogenics are involved in their hop process or whatever they do with their hops. I, it, it had it on the side of the box. I, I I decided I was gonna try to properly summarize it, then I realized I don't need to properly summarize this particular brewery's cryogenic uh, treatment of their <laughs> hops. So that's what I've got. Are you sure you don't want to give us a quick thirty minute rundown? <laughs> we could, could could Google what that means and, and try to go through the particular sciences of it. It'd be fun. Uh, but yeah, it's an imperial IPA, uh, tropical flavor and citrus, which is refreshing because it's it's like it's not a hundred degrees today, but it was it was a hundred degrees yesterday out here, and I was not not happy about that. No, I, nobody can be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so before we get into talking about the plot lines of this book, which boy, we're gonna have to do some work to summarize because uh, this the like, Stalingrad uh, and its sequel, Life and Fate, have are often said in the same breath as talking about uh war and peace with good reason uh there are a billion characters and a lot of story threads to keep a track of so we're gonna do our best not necessarily gonna keep track of every character um every minor character moment that happens but we'll be covering as much as we can but again before we get into that um let's talk a little bit about the context around this book so when we're approaching context for stalingrad it's difficult or at least when we sat down to think about the context we're going to be adding over these course of these 10 episodes, uh, it's difficult to figure out exactly what we want to zoom in on. Obviously, Stalingrad is a battle fought in World War II, as I'm sure you're aware at this point. Um, but beyond that, how do we provide context? We talk about World War II as a whole. Do we talk about the context, the factors that went into it? Do we talk about uh, the initiators? Do we talk about the the fascist rising in, uh, in the 30s, not only in uh, Germany, which would go on to invade the Soviet Union, but also in Italy or in Spain, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Do we focus in on the Soviet Union in the years up to this? Um, and so I think we're going to try to go for something that's a little bit more getting at various lessons that hopefully will connect by so by the end you feel like you walk away with a better uh perspective on the events surrounding stalingrad specifically because we could talk about the whole war and some people spend their whole lives talking about the war uh sometimes for some people that's our whole person personality um and we're not necessarily trying to do that and although we can't uh, assume that you're going to have a, a full grasp on world war ii going into this book which would certainly help uh we're also not going to make this kind of the place for that uh, although I, I i do love world war ii we're not experts in this field uh so what i will do is contribute books uh, we're gonna we're gonna have that in the description of every episode uh various ones that uh I or Matt have read and enjoyed uh, regarding this period. They will not necessarily be comprehensive in and of themselves. I, for example, I'm a lot more interested in a lot of the social elements of the war, so a lot of what I'll be recommending will not be like military tactics and battles. And, you know, in my mind, it's all fun and good to learn about the Battle of the Wolge and the late war or whatever, but I find that more interesting in a museum than I necessarily do in my reading. So for today, uh, we're going to be talking about two main things. Uh, One, Roughly the place of the Soviet Union in World War II uh, and the importance of the Soviet Union and Stalingrad specifically. Why Stalingrad? Uh, And in addition to that, I also want to introduce one of the books from the list each time. So today I'm just going to be giving giving some quick space to the book Day Without End, uh, which is also known as Combat uh, by Van Van Prague. Uh, Now that's an interesting novel. I actually picked it up outside of a record store. They had a little table where they were selling 25 cent books and i picked up just a bunch of trashy you know 50s and 60s era books that were a quarter each and thought this will be fun for for a lark and it was actually as i understand it a van van prague is a a pseudonym for the author but as at least as according to the book it was written by uh you know a foot soldier in the war and it essentially details the psychological effects on soldiers of just endless combat uh in this case the the endless combat of three days for this captain leading a a, a a squad of of soldiers uh, which is a really interesting read it's been a while but and it's certainly not super common and it looks very pulpy when you find it online but i think it's really uh, if you're kind of 
interested in that kind of worm's eye view as opposed to a bird's eye view of combat. I think it's a really just one interesting one to go alongside uh, books by like Alexeyevich, which also a lot of books by Alexeyevich will be on the list, or also by, if you've ever read it, uh, The Good War uh, by Studs Terkel, which is similarly to Alexeyevich's work uh, in oral history of the war. Although on Turkle's side of naturally from the American perspective, if you have any other books that you might want to contribute to the list that you think might be helpful for people, you can go ahead and email them to us at tipsytolstoy at gmail.com. We'll be more than happy to take a look at them. And if they look good, I throw them on the list to recommend to other people as well. And as, just as a reminder, you can always find them in the show notes. Okay, let's talk about World War II in the context of the Soviet Union for Stalingrad, so it's not going to be a huge topic. Um, I want to focus in on one thing in particular here, which is, um, and certainly if you've been raised in the U.S., and about 50% of our listeners are from the U.S., um, you may have gotten the perspective from watching either half-heartedly or full-heartedly, like Band of Brothers, or Saving Private Ryan, or Flags of Our Fathers, or Hacksaw Ridge, or... I got, there are like a billion other movies about World War II. You probably may have gotten the idea that like the U.S. is was hugely involved in the war. And of course, in the later years on the Western Front and the Pacific Wars, yes, they were. Although, of course, uh, the whole of World War II goes from September 1st in 1939 to, I don't remember the exact date, in 1945. I should have written that down. Uh, there's six years there. And, and one of the things we have to pay attention to is that the war starts in stages because the U.S. Uh, does not join the war until after the bombings of Pearl Harbor on the 7th of uh, Jan- 7th of uh, December, excuse me, in 1942. So the U.S. is actually only involved from 1943 to 1945. Uh, even the Soviet Union is only involved after our Operation Barbarossa, where Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union in 1941. So the, the war is happening in years. And, you know, arguably, at least how I look at it, you don't even have to start it there. Uh, the war is proper, of course, starts on with the invasion of Poland by both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, which at this time had a non-aggression pact with the, the, Nazi, with the, the Nazi party. I think you could, and I personally do, kind of start the war, in a sense, um, in with the Spanish Civil War, which started, which went from 1936 to 1939, which, of course, pit, pitted the forces of uh, General Francisco Franco, uh, who was a, a, a fascist and a phalangist up against uh, the so-called Spanish Republicans, uh, the official Spanish government, uh, Although most of the war, the so-called Spanish Republicans were primarily anarchists and communists. Um, and there's a good book by Adam Hochschild, uh, Spain in Our Hearts, which I would definitely recommend about that conflict. Although you could also look at other things. Uh, Orwell wrote, of course, very famously, homage to Catalonia uh, or George Orwell, as we mentioned a long, long time ago uh, in, our, in our opinion piece about uh, 1984, uh, was a combatant in the Spanish Civil War. And uh, on, of course, the side of the phalangist, you had the support of uh, Italy and Germany. Uh, the German Air Force participated in it. Uh, of course, the famous painting Guernica by Pablo Picasso portrays uh, such a Luftwaffe raid uh, on a civilian village. And on the other side, you have the Soviet Union supporting the, the their so-called Republicans. Um, by and large, the Allies abandoned the Spanish Republicans in this period. Uh, the French, the uh, British, the Americans uh, largely embargoed both sides. Although, although as Hochschild no- notes, uh, many in the military seem to actually have sympathies for General Franco and would let supplies get through, even though if they had been had been found, unlike volunteers for the Spanish Republicans. And in fact, actually, um, the American company Texaco, uh, which is still around, uh, was the primary source of oil for the uh, Francoist regime uh, based on the sympathies of the CEO at the time, I think Torvald Reber, I'll correct the exact name in the show notes, uh, who was a sympathizer of General Francisco Franco. And although the U.S. caught them several times transporting oil uh, to the Francoists, they never did more than find them each time, meaning essentially that uh, that the embar- U.S. embargo, by failing to stop support for the Francoist forces, but successfully stopping people going to fight against the Francoists uh, indirectly supported the the Francoist regime. And that's not the point of this podcast. I just can't help I can't help but talk about the Spanish Civil War whenever it comes up. Uh, so Spanish Civil War, sorry, you got that additional addendum. Let's take it back to 1941 on- onward post Operation Barbarossa, which like we mentioned is when Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union. Going back to what I was saying all the way at the beginning of this, because I have a habit of getting off topic, uh, we if you may have this perception that the U.S. and um, also Britain and France uh, were the primary, like we're carrying the brunt of the war. And don't get me wrong, there was a huge amount of fighting and huge amounts of deaths on the 
Western Front, and also I should say the North African Front, as well as for both primarily the British, also some of uh, some Americans fighting in um, colonized regions in Southeast Asia. Um, the in a way, the vast majority of the war was fought on the Eastern Front. I, I don't really know how to, to convey it in a better way than to talk about statistics, although that can be deeply unsatisfying. But and although I should say that battle statistics are of World War II are deeply debated even to today, uh, it can be kind of difficult to talk about them and in a way that's especially non-exaggerated. Uh, but just to compare, like the the difference in deadliness of the Western Front and the Eastern Front, the Western Front being where the British and the Americans and some number of partisans of, like, say, the French of, of Free France were fighting, um, the Eastern Front being where the Soviet Union, also Yugoslavia, as well as partisans from um, occupied regions like Ukraine and Belarus, as well as many other, uh, Poland also, not just the Soviet Union, uh, I mean to say, but, you know, when you think about it, you're primarily thinking of the Red Army. Um, the uh, German historian Rudiger Overmans did undertook a uh, casual undertook a study of casualties in the Second World War uh, entitled "German Military Casualties in the Second World War," uh, and he found uh, that uh, up until the dates of December thirty first, nineteen forty four, on the Western Front, approximately three thousand three hundred thirty nine in nine hundred fifty seven uh, Wehrmacht soldiers had died. Compare that to uh, the Eastern Front, where we find he estimates 2,742,909 soldiers had died. Now, that's only until 1944. In 1945, uh, he notes it's difficult to differentiate because, of course, both uh, the Soviet Union and the Allies in the West are closing in in Germany. So these, these fighting is happening in Germany. It's hard to differentiate battle deaths on which side they're happening. But in that year, about 1,230,045 Wehrmacht soldiers died. Uh, he estimates that in that last year, about two-thirds of them could be attributed to the Eastern Front, although it should be noted that two-thirds is actually a more conservative estimate than other historians have given. So based on some some back of napkin math, Overman kind of estimates that total losses, and I assume by losses, uh, this refers to both deaths and and uh, wounds or casualties, I should say, um, that about four million uh, Wehrmacht soldiers were casualties of the Eastern Front, whereas one million were casualties of the Western Front. Four out of five soldiers, in other words, were casualties of the Eastern Front. I mean to say this that a huge amount of the war was fought on the Eastern Front. It can be hard to imagine, like the scale of losses. Um, and let's I mean, look at Stalingrad specifically. Um, although, again, like it's like we've said, it's hard to figure out exactly how many people died, and still uh, debated to today. In her book, uh, Vasily Grossman: The Soviet Century, uh, Alexandra Popov estimates about two million dead on both sides, and I assume she means she includes civilians in this number. And in the course of less than a year, in the Battle of Stalingrad, you have just an unimaginable number of dead. I mean, to put that in perspective, the number of dead in Stalingrad of both the Wehrmacht and the Soviet Union, meaning both civilians and soldiers, uh, is greater in this one city than it is of the entire war of casualties in, say, um, combining the U.S. and Britain and Canada. Just one city, not even a full year. It's difficult to imagine. So Stalingrad is often talked about as the turning point of the war. Now, whether or not that's true, that is uh, debated by historians, as uh, P.M.H. Bell points out in uh, the chapter of their book, The Battle of Stalingrad, 1942, or July 1942 to February 1943. Uh, it's argued, and perhaps successfully, that that was actually not the most militarily important battle on the Eastern Front, uh, instead saying maybe it was Moscow in 1941, maybe it was cursed in 1943. Uh, however, Bell continues to argue that the Battle of Stalingrad should be considered the turning point of the entire war, even if it wasn't most, the most militarily important, because of, uh, first of all, the fact that by the end of the Battle of Stalingrad, which ended in a complete destruction of General Paulus's armies, um, you, have, you do have a, a genuine military victory, uh, which up until that point, the Wehrmacht had just gone through victory after victory uh bell writes before stalingrad the germans won one victory after another with only limited setback in the winter of 1941 to 1942 after stalingrad they won no more victories even in the summer so like i said a whole german army simply ceases to exist and the primary uh, military goals of the wehrmacht at that time had been to a capture the oil fields of the caucus and b to capture stalingrad 
now both of those goals have failed in addition to the army trying to undertake that just simply not being there anymore um at the same time that was a huge uh propaganda victory for the ussr as you might imagine uh it's noted by bell that the ussr always had a keen eye for taking advantage of these sort of things uh and so 40 uh, the number they deployed a number of camera crews and during the war about 40 cameramen died uh recording um and so those images out of stalingrad around the world uh, created uh, a, like a, a sense of, of Soviet victoriousness. I mean, these the images that people around the world were seeing were the ones being saw, shot by Soviet camera teams. So there's a huge morale victory uh, of the, the Soviet army, which at this point, uh, of the Red Army, which to this point has been losing battle after battle. And uh, after the Battle of Stalingrad, it, you start to see a change in attitudes. And at the same time, on the side of, the, of, of Germany, uh, up to this point, Stalingrad had held huge symbolic importance for uh, Hitler. Um, it, in fact, it, it, although it did not really seem this way at first when the Wehrmacht first approached um, Stalingrad, as the conflict dragged on, it seems increasingly that, uh, that the symbolic value way overshadowed the military value uh, for both Stalin and Hitler, and even to some, in, in some cases against the advice of some of their staff, I kept pouring more and more troops into this. Uh, and Stalingrad, for example, became a huge feature of Hitler's speeches. Um, it was kind of the the victory in the Volga region was going to be representative of, you know, the victory of the, the Aryan German forces over the inferior Slavs of these, the suspicious Judeo-Bolsheviks, as they would have called um, the, as they would have called the Soviets. And uh, at the same time, it kind of held that sort of moral value for for Stalin, as far as we can tell. Uh, and you can tell this by the orders that were that were issued during this time. So in the book, uh, the Soviet Century, in the chapter of the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, Popov writes, "Interrogations of German POWs revealed Hitler's brutal treatment of his troops that winter." Grossman, in this case, uh, talking about Vasily Grossman's experiences. Grossman was present during interrogations of captured German soldiers who spoke about Hitler's order to take, quote, not a step back from the captured territory, end quote. The prisoners said that the order was read out to them along with death sentences for deserting. On July 28, 1942, during the German summer offensive, Stalin introduced a similar order, number 227, known as, quote, not one step back, end quote. Stalin's directive read, panic mongers and cowards should be exterminated on the spot. So on both sides in this conflict, it's so important that that Hitler and Stalin like issue uh, orders for execution for anyone who retreats. This conflict had that kind of symbolic power. So why Stalingrad? Why is Vasily Grossman writing this book? Uh, first of all, it should be noted that Grossman was there for a number of months uh, and felt a sense of emptiness after having left, left. Even after winning an award for his writing in the war, uh, he seems to have... Uh, thought more about the people, the nameless men and women, who will never have the same recognition that he would. And speaking of Grossman, we'll talk about more about him next week. Uh, but this week, we just wanted to kind of cover, like, why are we talking about Stalingrad? What was the Soviet part in the war? But we'll continue on with more features, getting to more of the story, like how Grossman in his book kind of tells you some stuff, and over the course of the novel, expands on, for example, the characters that he mentions briefly in an earlier chapters. So that is roughly what I wanted to talk about. Uh, like I said, check our show notes for some of the books that we might recommend on this topic. Don't forget, if you got some other books that you think might be helpful, uh, email them to tipsytolstoy at gmail.com, and we'll see if we should throw them on the list. And also, you should definitely check out the book from our friend Dr. Ian Garner, Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival, in which he takes uh, short stories written at and after the conflict uh, to kind of reveal the Russian narrative of Stalingrad uh, contemporaneously. You know, of course, remember, although Stalingrad, the book by Gross is an attempt to show people what it was like it's also written after the fact and it has knowledge that of course this battle is going to be won it's going to be one of the most glorious victories um, of the war for the red army so looking at them from contemporaneous accounts sounds very interesting you should definitely take a look at it if you're able Uh, maybe your local library or local university library will have it and we also uh, want to mention that, uh, of course, Dr. Garner has written uh, has a website in which you can read a number of wonderful articles. But I just wanted to highlight here, and you'll be able to find the show notes uh, from Stalingrad to the Stars, Science Fiction and Memory in Putin's Russia, which talks about the legacy of Stalingrad in popular memory today, which is super cool. Broadly speaking, that's our context for today. Um, we'll be throwing in more as we go. Come back as it's next relevant. time for more context. <laughs> we'll never stop. <laughs> 
subscribe for more horrible facts. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm super excited to get into this. I know this isn't really context, but Stalingrad, the copy, so that we're reading the copy translated by Robert Chandler and Robert and Elizabeth Chandler. And I believe that might be the only, this is certainly the only comprehensive English language version, but it's wild. I mean, this is, this was of course written and released during Stalin's lifetime, um, which maybe is why it's as, as, as um, Chandler su suggests in the introduction to the book, why this book has historically not been looked at super seriously because how could a book about World War II released while Stalin was live really truly capture it? Uh, but the Chandler's, and this was only released in, I want to say, was this 2019 when it was released? Yes. Is that just the copy I have? Yeah, 20, so within the last three years, uh, this book uh, was been finally compiled. The Chandler's uh, went through, there's a lot of very different editions of this book uh, with different censorship or different uh, things censored, et cetera, et cetera. And so they put together a book based on Grossman's notes, trying to include anything that he seemed to have wanted originally and that was removed not by his own request, taking out things that seemed to have been taken out by him, uh, by uh, Grossman himself. So this is, a, in some ways, a constructed book. Certainly not what you would have been reading in the USSR when, when um, Stalingrad at the time was released under the title of, in English, uh, For a Just Cause. Certainly not what they would have been reading, but perhaps something at least what the Chandler's hope was to create a book closer to what Grossman would have actually wanted, um, including things like, for example, and I can't say this for certain, but of course, as we'll talk about later, the USSR was not huge on, uh, of course, anti-Semitism was alive and well in the USSR. So singling out, you know, Jewish citizens as a particular note, uh, like as noted, noting that they were particularly hated by the Nazis, that didn't always jive with kind of, Official depictions of war as something that everyone suffered equally when, of course, not everyone did suffer equally, although everyone suffered greatly. And so when Grossman, who was himself Jewish and, in fact, wrote, um, documented a lot of uh, Nazi war crimes against Jews specifically, and who was himself uh, deeply personally affected by Nazi war crimes against Jews, um, uh, includes a lot of that in this book, a lot of conversation around, which um, I can't say for certain, but I would, I, I, would hesit I would hazard a guess to say that a lot of those elements were not necessarily included in the original Probably not. Least in the USSR. <laughs> Probably yeah. not. Probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, before we get into the summary, is there anything you wanted to mention, Matt? I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful context and also mention how critically important it still is for people studying the 20th century, like myself. Um, not to pat myself on the back with importance or anything, but it's just fascinating to think about the fact that for such a major author, there's still no like definitive version of some of his works. I'm pretty sure Robert Chandler mentions that in the introduction that Life and Fate still doesn't have a mm -hmm. complete edition in in Russian, which is it's it's just crazy. It's just crazy. Yeah, I think that people are so fast to judge the art of the Soviet Union, particularly art that came out under Stalin because they assume it all just must be the same thing that we've 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 strided over some really really important things that are only just now kind of we're going back and saying wait wait a minute maybe this is something that we should devote some attention to but i mean the fact that something like this is only being released in english in 2019 that's well that's pretty crazy quite frankly yeah it's wild but hopefully um I certainly, <laughs> uh, our hope by covering Stalingrad is to touch on, and one of the greatest hopes of our podcast is to bring not only context to well-loved and well-read literatures, but also uh, bring a platform to lesser-read things like Stalingrad, like the Polikhaevs, like Prince, um, to show the, I don't know, the, the endurance of art through a lot of different circumstances and and what we can learn from that yeah and don't get me wrong of course of course tolstoy and dostoevsky perform <laughs> probably 10 times better than any of our ep other episodes but there is a contingency of our listeners that will listen to anything and that's who we do it for <laughs> <laughs> to, to you to you weirdos who stick by us mm -hmm. but through thick and thin mm -hmm. thank you and to those of you who are just who are looking for bigger stuff that's okay too you know we're all here for our own reasons um, and that's, that's fine. Matt and I, we are here to, uh, give as much context as we can, but also sometimes we just want to get into some weird stuff that people aren't talking about that often. 
uh, which is what Stalingrad is going to be. I don't even think this one's that weird, which is what's so what makes the situation even weirder. Yeah, that's true. It's not the deepest cut we've done, but we should get into it. We should, um, because this is. Um, and I know we keep putting off actually covering what's happening in this book, and I suspect this is going to be one of our longer episodes because we have so much to say about this already. And of course, uh, Stalingrad is part of a, 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 I don't want to say this word, dialogy? Dilogy? Dialogy? Like a trilogy, but only two of them, a, a dialogy. A two-book two elegy. Yes, mm-hmm. two-book elegy. Uh, Stalingrad is then succeeded by Life and Fate, uh, which continues these stories, many stories of Stalingrad. Uh, it's been noted by Chandler that Stalingrad is a lot more prosaic, for example. It's much more like Grossman writing, just trying to convey what living in the war was like, whereas Life and Fate is a lot more high-minded in many ways uh, and has a lot more, so to speak, um, ideology and thoughts going into it. And it also, it's, of course, it was, was released after, uh, well, a lot of it was written after Stalin's death and further out from World War II than Stalingrad was written. Um, but even though it's not necessarily the more thoughtful of the two books it is as chandler notes perhaps the more real of the two because that was grossman's goal in in writing this was just to make you feel what it was like to be there day to day and i think it succeeds wonderfully in that regard yeah i was so attached to some of these characters even the ones that you get just a little a little bit of a a taste before grossman switches you over to somebody else that I was like, oh no, this is so bad because I know they're going to die, most likely. <laughs> so I'm upset that I'm already this attached to them. Yep, yep. All right, well, let's, well, we'll, we'll learn about that as we go. Um, I, my summary is going to be as brief as I can, uh, hopefully briefer than usual, but probably still pretty long. A lot of my summary, honestly, is going to be reading lines from this book because, my goodness, uh, Robert Chandler, of course, is, is a great translator. Um, but man, Grossman's prose, again, you know, translated through chandler and and or robert and elizabeth chandler it's so it's so beautiful it's such beautiful prose yeah this is i think a really well done translation but also a really well done original yeah okay so let's get into the book so the book kicks off not with any individual characters that you'll be covering for most of the book but actually it kicks off with a meeting between uh hitler and mussolini hitler more or less covering uh what the plans are in terms of pushing forward into the USSR and, and into Stalingrad, not specifically, but along the way for their other military goals. Um, it's from Benito Mussolini's point of view, and it's it's so interesting the way he writes Mussolini. It really is. I thought it was going to be really boring and dry mm-hmm. the way he starts it, but it wasn't. No, it's remarkable. It's like, it's in many ways, I don't know if this is specifically what he's thinking, but it's it basically sets you and it takes place on 29th of April, 1942. It sets you in the place. It sets you in the time. It tells you what's going on. It tells you broadly what's happening in the war, if you're not familiar, uh, from Mussolini's perspective. And every character has, a, even though they're only in here for, I want to say, maybe 15, 20 pages, less than only 18, um, a remarkable depth of character is brought to all the Mussolini's, uh, he, the way he is, the way Hitler holds a room, the way that he seems to be talking to his own specters um, and talking to them and cares more about them than anyone who's actually there. A Mussolini's own feeling of almost inadequacy that he is the father of fascism and yet he's basically just here to hand wave and sign off on whatever hitler wants um in the various ways that people in his own family people in the cabinets relate to each of the leaders it's remarkable and, and here's here's a line um here's a, a just kind of describing what the feeling was and it's impossible not to feel what <laughs> grossman's trying to convey when with such wonderful prose as dominion over vast areas of europe and africa appeared to be strengthening the power of fascism with every year every day every hour the new order established by hitler throughout conquered europe had seen the modernization and renewal of all the methods and techniques of violence that had arisen in the course of thousands of years of the rule of the few over the many uh, and a lot of this chapter is essentially conveying a source of t- sense of triumphalism of of these leaders but it adds the caveat at the end and of course again this is written from a soviet perspective so naturally the soviet perspective post-war so it's it's a bit of editorializing, but I thought it was well well written. But the greater Hitler's success, the blinder he became. He was unable to conceive that not everything in the world was propaganda or political posturing, that there might be other real forces in the world, and there might exist governments capable of doing more than transmitting their own impotence to their workers, soldiers, and sailors. Hitler was unable to conceive that his fist could not smash through everything. 
So we transition over to the Soviet perspective with uh, Pyotr Semyonovich Vavilov. Uh, Vavilov is a, a laborer. He is from a rural town, is a, more or less a farmer. Uh, and most of his plans for this day had basically just been to fix up the the shack that your or a small house that he lives in with his wife and uh, wife and two children. You know, they have three children, but one is off fighting in the war. Um, and he receives a summons to go up to the front. And the rest of it is basically him going through his day as he quickly tries to sort out the rest of his affairs, go into town, tell people, oh, here, here's what I produced. Here's what you should use it for. Um, going back, trying to fix everything that he thinks his wife doesn't know how to do um, and feeling, you know, naturally strange about this, about what's going on and, and the way his family reacts, the way his youngest son, who's, I think, you know, m- barely more than a toddler, his younger daughter, uh, who's single digits, react to him leaving and the, the strangely distant yet very tender way that he and his wife deal with these things to two people who obviously have great care for each other but you know have been brought together by circumstance more or less the expectation in a way god this book has so much power even in just vavilov and his wife just quietly sitting while he cuts wood uh for when he's for when he's gone um it's it's it's, i don't know there's it's got such a um a sense of life that's that's really where gross grossman succeeds i mean he succeeds in a lot of fronts but creating a sense of life um and when vavilov is looking out along the farm it's noted that he felt guilty before the earth before the fields he would no longer be able to plow this autumn and he felt guilty before his wife on whose shoulders he would be laying a burden he had until then bore himself um and it more or less follows along his feelings and they're very negative even though he recognizes in the book notes the importance of of him of of individuals fighting for their way the way they live um in many senses they cannot really take on that perspective because for the children and for his wife their their father their husband is leaving and Vavilov um he's leaving everything to him that seems good in the world to go to an almost certain death i really think that grossman shows himself as just as master stylist in the first three chapters alone Mm -hmm. where he transitions from writing this very grand scale uh fascist inferiority complex with Mussolini to then stooping down if you will to just the level of this very granular individual and I think that that is probably partially where a lot of people draw the comparison between Tolstoy Mm -hmm. and Grossman that's one of the questions for me that I'm looking at is why does everybody without fail say that when you talk about Grossman? So it's kind of one of the things that I'm keeping my eye out for. But yeah, like you said, the the sense of life, I think, in this chapter is really permeated by the, the emphasis on kind of the, the naturalism. Really, everything around Favilov is alive. It's really interesting the way he writes it yeah absolutely and every character i mean we'll uh we'll we'll note this even further later because there are a lot of characters i was referencing i was trying to make my own graphs i was referencing the persona um you know the the list of characters in the back of the book a lot um you, you have to, it's it's uh grossman writes uh, a life and along the way he's just like oh well, he explains it as you go but much like walking to a family dinner of you know a friend or someone there's a whole lived experience there which you're introduced to over time but the whole way through the sense is there that it exists the connections exist yeah not not to make myself out to be too much of a literary chad but normally <laughs> i don't have to reference character charts because I, I i got it you know I, they don't give me half a phd for nothing over here but <laughs> it, it de- this was one of them i was like oh boy this is a lot of characters all at once in my mm-hmm. face yep yep um, and a lot of characters who have really individual personalities. I remember mm-hmm. when we read Anna Karenina, one of the things you noted about the relationship between Anna and uh, Steva is that a lot of a lot of times in literature, you're just told that someone are family members, and then you say keep keep that in mind. But that's a different thing from writing people like family members um, mm-hmm. and seeing like the way that different people kind of rhyme and their experiences are similar uh even if they how they react to those experiences or tendencies that are shared among a family might differ and you can really feel that among all these characters even though there's like eight of them in a room yeah you could probably point it out but usually i feel like when you meet people who are related there's there's something that you can't quite put your finger on but you can 
understand kind of inherently that mm-hmm. they're related. And it's kind of the same thing while reading. This was the same effect on me when I was trying to piece together who was related to who. There was just kind of this innate sense. And again, this is definitely going to be a book that I'm going to want to go back and read multiple times probably. So it'll be interesting to read with a with a firmer sense of who is who when I go back to see those details that I completely missed the first time this time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was that was a good comparison. I like that. Uh, so we go from there to the birthday party of one Alexandra Vladimirovna uh, Shaposhnikova. Uh, Shaposhnikova is a chemist and a woman who has got an extensive family. Um, although her husband has, has died, uh, she has four <laughs> children, one son, Dmitri, three daughters, Ludmila, who's the oldest, Marussia, who's the middle, and uh, Zhenya, who's the youngest. And each of them have their own children. Ludmila, her oldest son, Tolia, uh, Dmitri, who is... I believe Dimitri's in prison at this point. He's in. A, he's in. A, he was um, um, arrested as a political prisoner in the USSR. Uh, his oldest son is Seryozha, who is not exactly, but basically uh, Alexandra's favorite grandchild. Um, and then Ver- Marusia also has a daughter, an eighteen-year-old daughter named Vera, who is a, who's a nurse. Genia is the youngest. Uh, she's very artistic. She's a little bit flighty. She was previously married to a man named a party member named Krimov, who uh, will become more relevant later on, but has since become divorced. They are at a party along with Sofia Osipovna, who is a surgeon and a friend of Alexandra's, as well as several other people, uh, Mostovsky, Andreev, Bereskina, who are all friends of Alexandra. We'll, we'll talk more about them because there are entirely too many people to explain all at once. Uh, but even though they are in the middle of a war and they'll feel a little bad about trying to pool all the resources for alcohol and food, um, it feels very natural for them to come together and try to enjoy a bit of life. And this is an extended scene as we learn more about each of them and the way that they interact with each other, as well as some other characters. Uh, um, Marusia's husband, uh, Spiridonov, is there, Stepan. And it's it's a lot. It's a lot. They they cover the war. Uh, Tolia's friend uh, Kovalyov is there. He, he's a lieutenant. He's had as about as much combat experience as you can have as a person. Um, and so they discuss the war. Stepan and Kovalyov argue. Uh, they talk about food relationships. Uh, who's you know who is in love with whom? All that kind of stuff. And it's a very natural. It's a party. Uh, following on that. Um, they, once it breaks up, Mostovsky and Andreev go out for a walk. Uh, we follow Mostovsky's story. Mostovsky is a an old Bolshevik who is an intellectual and to today has become as a, as, as a writer and even in the middle of the war is out doing tons of research. And that's what covers that, that's what follows most of his life. And walking through the city at night, he feels a great sense of sadness remembering his youth as an internationalist and seeing people from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from the Americas, uh, and seeing them at international conferences, and he's overcome with this great sadness that, you know, he's not certain they're going to win the war, and maybe that will all have been for nothing. So that's that's difficult for him, to, as you might sure. understand, to take. And so he and Andreev walk along the streets at night and say very little to each other. And uh, Mostovsky thinks he thinks upon the change from the imperial era to the Soviet era, mostly lauding all the changes that the Soviet era has brought, especially the the vast increase in literacy. So we we leave them out essentially at night uh, back in the apartment. Uh, Tolia uh, Alexandra is getting on Tolia to write to his his mother Dmitri's uh, Dmitri's wife uh, Tolia, who at this point has been, as it's noted, it's in order to really to to live as a soldier and to like leave you have to harden yourself because it's very painful to remember that you love your family and they go off to possible death uh, and so tolia is has come home and has let down all his defenses um and is happy to be there happy to be among the people he loves and he's trying to harden himself again but it's it's like noted that's not entirely successful and in many ways he uh is it, it comes off as him trying to argue with his family more so than anything i think it's not probable or I, yeah i don't think it's Mm. potential death i think it's certain death almost certain death yeah or almost certain death yeah that seems to be the pervading sense to me at least yeah um yeah every character they basically expect to die is is i mean you know uh, an entire generation of people were lost in this war i'm going to say by the end of the war 40 million soldiers and civilians in eastern europe and soviet territories were dead so that's an almost incomprehensible number 
So Mm -hmm. yeah, death is expected. Um, So before he leaves, he argues a lot with his grandmother, Alexandra. And it's only like in the very moment, last moments before he's able to leave that he's able to break down and admit to her that's only because he's scared um, and because he does not want to, he can't leave, he can't leave them that he has to build these barriers and he's not being successful in doing it. Um, And before he leaves, like grabs his grandmother and, you know, um, calls her as babushka, as babusia, his darling babulia, and then rush toward the door, his head bowed. Uh, following that, we go to Vera, who is, of course, the daughter of Marusia and Stepan, uh, working her shift in the hospital. Um, she has kind of fallen in love with a with a, a fighter pilot who's been, who's been brought in after he's been shot down. She's quite young herself; she's only eighteen, and um, she has she's been working here. Obviously, <laughs> been seeing quite a, a bit of of bloodiness. Uh, but Viktorov, despite being uh, someone who is often quite sought after by many of her patients, uh, it's Viktorov who didn't pursue her at all, has caught her attention the most by being uh, not classically attractive, it's noted, but interesting and, uh, and thoughtful and uh, many other things. Quite a successful pilot, he's only 20 himself, and he's, he's quite literary and he's a reader, and that's where, mostly what they seem to talk about. Um, which is something that she's kind of been keeping from her family. Following that, we jump over to Alexandra. Keep in mind that she's a chemist, uh, and her work is essentially to uh, work in factories and make sure that they are not overly polluted, which is something that many factory workers don't initially appreciate, but uh, as is noted in the course of one particular visit, often as she spends more time with them, they come to learn to appreciate her and understand her and listen to her uh, and even take her very seriously and treat her like uh, their, their grandmother, their own grandmother. Um, well, while well, uh, examining this factory on the way back, her car happens to break down or the truck transmitting all, transporting all of her equipment breaks down. So she goes to the nearby uh, power station, the Stalgres power station, which is run by Stepan Spiridonov, who you might recall is Marusia's husband. She gets is able to get him to deliver, get a ride for all of her equipment as well as her assistant. Uh, and they talk more about life, about his work. He shows her the factory and Alexandra shows, sees her son-in-law in a new light. Uh, and they talk about Vera, Vera thinks she's being uh, secretive with Viktorov, but of course uh, Stepan has heard through someone else that that something has quite happened, and maybe they will, maybe 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 his daughter will be getting married soon. And Alexandra, it takes. I a- love the gossip train on that one that he found <laughs> out from his secretary, right? Who was talking yeah. to someone else? Who was talking to someone else? It's just hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, and following that, Spiro Donov uh, meets up with a, uh, an acquaintance of his, Ivan Priakin, uh, who's just been promoted to be the first secretary of the party committee for the entire province. Um, and they think on the city, which they both grown up. Oh, I don't believe, I don't think uh, Stepan is not from Stalingrad, but Priakin is. Um, and they reflect on their relationship. Uh, Priakin tries, to, after speaking, uh, Stepan obviously congratulates Priyakin on his promotion. Priyakin decides to walk home, and Stepan is like, it's a three-hour walk home. I will, <laughs> let me get you a ride. And Priyakin says, no, I, I want to go. And Stepan in that moment kind of realizes that it's a man who is facing the loss of a city, Stalingrad. They're not certain anything's going to be left at this this point, just wanting to appreciate the things that he grew up with um, and lets him go, which is uh, like, <laughs> which I bring up, even though it's a small moment, is a remarkably touching one. And we end off mm-hmm. on part 18, which is where we're going to stop for today. It's about 102 pages in to our copy uh, with Genia and Marusia back at home discussing their family life as well as uh, other things that are going on, um, as, as well as the war broadly and uh, how it's going. Uh, and, and finally, it ends on Seryosha volunteering for a youth brigade to go out and dig ditches and uh, the family arguing whether or not he should be allowed to do that. And then finally, they turn to Alexandra uh, as the kind of matriarch and the one who is doted on Seryosha th- the most thoroughly for one last kick in the gut before this part ends. And they ask her, <laughs> Alexandra, you know, or they say, you know, uh, uh, what, what should we do? And Alexandra looked up as if sitting before a tribunal and said, Sir Yoja, you must do as you... I... She faltered, got quickly to her feet, and left the room. There was a moment of silence. Vera, whose heart that day was so open, so ready to show kindness and sympathy, scowled crossly to hold back her tears. Uh, so, real kick in the gut there at the end. Um, and that's mm-hmm. where we leave uh, our part one of, of Stalingrad at chapter 18. W- walking away from this, you said you had you could talk for a whole hour without even breathing. 
what would you want to talk about? I mean, what, what are the big things you want to point out to people reading this? I was looking a lot at the characterization mm-hmm. personally. Mm-hmm. Just I became really interested in the way that Grossman writes his characters. I thought it was very unique, I mm-hmm. guess. I It's one of those things where I'm not exactly sure what to say about it except for just read it because it's very good and you will enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> I'm almost certain of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was really amazed at the way that he, like I said, kind of oscillates between the individual and the grand or the epic and the way that he's constantly reminding you of that connection. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I can see how that style would be reminiscent of Tolstoy. However, I really think that his messaging is not at all what Tolstoy would have been (laughs) advocating Mm -hmm. for. Right. Uh, I know that you had mentioned that you didn't feel like he was writing, like he wasn't writing himself into these characters necessarily, but I do think there is a good bit of general socialist ideology that seeps into part of it. Though, that being said, I don't really think it's, I'll say this on socialist realism, I don't think what he's doing here is enough to call it its own genre, really. Mm -hmm. Another question I'm interested in not answering, but exploring more on the relationship between uh, Stalingrad and socialist realism. That really the the obligation to the collective is one of those things that stands out in the way that characters individually do or do not relate to that. And I, I'm gonna kind of just take a stab and assume that feeling obligated as an individual to your collective, your fates being bound to each other, is a good thing in this in this novel mm-hmm. in the world of this novel. Um, it may lead to bad consequences for you, the individual, but overall it should lead to good things for those around you. And that is not Tolstoy, and I don't think. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> There's this quote from Vavilov as he's being sent, as he's being called up to the war. For a moment he forgot that his own fate and that of the children asleep on the bed were bound to the fate of the country and all of its inhabitants. That the fate of his kolkhoz and the fate of the huge stone cities with their millions of citizens were one and the same. And to me, this is this is interesting in a lot of ways. One, you can link it to the Russian literary tradition. Tolstoy, of course, at the end of Anna Karenina, he sends Vronsky off to fight in the Serbo-Turkish War of 1876 to 1878. And he and Dostoevsky get into a <laughs> bit of a tiff over the, I guess, the, of the ethics, I guess, of not war per se, but of fighting for a cause that is not necessarily your cause or what even could constitute your cause it's a it's a separate issue from what we're looking at here um but what i was kind of talking about with socialist realism is you know is this is this really an inherently soviet belief the defense of your own country Mm. i don't think so i think there's of course this element of kind of communalism that is bound up in it but i push comes to shove i still think that a lot of the a lot of the messaging could be found in war literature from other countries. Oh, easily, yeah. And so I think like when people will kind of come at this and say, oh, it's just it's just socialist, it's just communist propaganda, uh, I'm kind of like, well, it is, if this is like kind of some of the most quote-unquote socialist things in the book, I'm like, okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also, I think it's, a, it's a remarkably tender to that perspective of like not wanting mm-hmm. to fight, of like not necessarily recognizing that your tight fate's time with the country. Because well, the same with someone famously, like Vavilov does recognize it, but also he's in he's with his family and he he can recognize he, he despite all of his frustrations and the moment when he has to leave recognizes how happy it makes him. Uh, Grossman provides the space to simultaneously show that yeah, of course that the Vavilov and his family's fate is tied together for the country and doing nothing would be worse for the them as a whole but all the same he provides space for him to feel sad at leaving it as if it were you know this is the only mm-hmm. important space in the world uh, and gives that real weight grossman is almost putting forth this point of like it's important for us all to do what we can and of course as a war reporter that makes sense but each individual life also has a meaning in this novel too mm-hmm. his perspective is complex and it's extremely tender i would say 
and it's it's very empathetic it's to very nuanced yeah extremely so it has a perspective it certainly i would say christmas perspective which is that it's necessary for we love to fight and yet he provides a great amount of space for negative feelings about that which i think is kind of remarkable actually mm-hmm. yeah not just feelings it's also strangely at Vivilov especially it's not completely human centric which is kind of a weird thing to note but i feel like in i feel like in the other socialist realism that i've read mm. it's all about dominating nature that's like a major core theme or it, it can be maybe not always but here it's a there are just a lot of references everywhere to you know the power of of water of wind of uh, the way that feelings can hold their own weight and it's not just it's not just personification it's more that there is sort of this internal life force of everything around that humans are part of but not necessarily on top of and that's just a weird thing that i noticed from this from these couple chapters the way that as he's leaving uh grossman writes a cold wind was blowing straight into his face blowing the last vestige of warmth the last breath of hearth and home out of his clothes and the way that his wife as he's leaving says she knew that these four walls would witness all her loneliness and to her they seemed bleak and empty just really quite interesting descriptions and yeah nature not always positive sometimes sometimes here negative (laughs) It, it was just it was just i liked it yeah that's it I liked it. Yeah. And all, like those details, that's what I found so remarkable uh, down to like his daughter, uh, Vavilov's daughter, insisting, takes, insisting that he takes gloves with him because it's going to be cold. Uh, and he refuses. He says, I forget what, what excuse he gives, but he basically tells her, no, you keep them internally thinking I'm going to be dead within like the next couple of months. And so it's better that my daughter has gloves than a corpse has them. Yeah, no, that's what I was saying earlier. Why I think it's this understanding of certain death. It's almost this common sense logic that you can see exactly in this quote, which is that oh, may as well leave it for someone else. Cause I'm gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is such a good open. I mean, we're not even five chapters in, we've already taken up most of this episode. This is, I mean, and even this episode, we're not even at the war part. <laughs> we're we're at, still at peace. We're still ish ish more or less. Yeah. The, the, uh, Stalingrad has not even been invaded yet. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm going to be, I know we're kind of coming to the end of the episode, we can push it out a little bit more. No, I want to talk about, no, we're not. We're going two hours, baby. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going, going two hours, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Three hour episode. Um, <laughs> just get a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, for the rest of these, we might, may, maybe have to with how much, how many thoughts we got about this. Uh, talk, I know I have a lot to say. Yeah. The dinner, I, the dinner is so remarkable. Um, I know, it, like I really, that was really brief in my summary, but that's the that is the bread and butter of this of part one of this yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, everyone is there. Um, the family, the uh, oh my, it's so it has the effect of being a fly on the wall at a family dinner where you don't know anybody <laughs> and you're trying to figure it all out as you're going. Yeah, <laughs> great. Two episodes ago, when we were talking to Christina uh, Gorcheva Newberry. One of the, the major strengths of her book was this feeling of, of being alive, of like these characters who had their own voices, perspectives, and, uh, you know, like having a conversation in, in a, in the kitchen felt very personal because it felt like mm-hmm. you were there mm-hmm. um, in the way a family might. This is the same thing um, with a lot with, with more characters, granted, but like this is an incredible amount of, like you said, this is, it's like being on the wall, fly at the wall. Um, and it's incredibly polyphonic because every pers- every character has their own perspective, and you know you see where they're coming from, uh, whether that be they're young and they're impressionable, or they're older and they're they're learned, or they're older and they're learned, and they're a civilian, or they're older and they're learned, or they're a soldier, uh, and you see them getting into arguments over whether or not the USSR is going to win, or whether or not they're screwed, or whatever, and everyone giving their perspectives, and it's remarkable how much of a sense of life of of like truly a lack of authorial perspective of course although that's that's inherently going to be there it, it it's not noticeable which is remarkable any given character mm-hmm. given your own predilections you might be thinking sit back and think yeah they, they sound right and that could go for any number of them <laughs> talking about what's going on yeah so kovalyov yeah. uh he and spiridonov spiridonov is very like yeah we're gonna win the war we're gonna stop them our defenses are great and kovalyov who is, of course, the most experienced soldier and has been fighting the most, is a lot more pessimistic, and they argue a lot. And Kovalyov gets a little too drunk, and Tolia 
starts to escort him out. And by the time before he, before he leaves, Kovalev turns around and kind of like bursts out in rage and says, what makes men surrender? I've heard people ask. Words, words, words. Fritz is still over 200 kilometers away, but people here are already packing their things. Before the front reaches Stalingrad, bureaucrats will be eating pies in Tashkent. Do you know what it's like at the front? Lie down for a few hours, and you wake to find Fritz has advanced 100 kilometers during the night. Words one thing, words are another. I've seen bureau rats take fright at a puff of wind, but soldiers get taken prisoner and die. And then bureaucrats in Tashkent point the finger at them. And believe me, I know those finger pointers. If they were encircled, you wouldn't catch them marching 500 kilometers, half starved to break through the German front. They'd be collaborators. They'd be police. They'd have fattened up nicely. But us soldiers have souls. And we know what it takes to keep fighting. Truth, that's what I care about. I want the truth, and I want it straight. And that's a remarkable... Uh, I mean, to call your own bureaucrats Nazi collaborators, <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah. Um, I would have. I mean, again, this is. I don't know if this. Is, I would hazard guess that was not included in the original copy, but again, stands to reason. Yeah, yeah. What we're reading, this is in, the sense of argumentation and everyone's perspective is so alive. Uh, I just love it. It's it's incredible. It's it feels so authentic in just like authentic i guess maybe authentic is the wrong word it feels so true to life i should say in a lot of ways sometimes i have to say like this is this is literary this is i mean of course literature is a a human interpretation of life but if your goal if your goal is to go out and try to paint a, a you know a picture perfect interpretation of life that's not how every all literature should be but if that's your goal uh it can hit really hard if you do it well and grossman does it well what was i just gonna say i just had a relevant thought <laughs> oh yes thank you <laughs> Ooh, got that thought back come back here, come here. <laughs> pull it back in all right <laughs> pull it back in um no i was gonna say i think it's really interesting this line that we're talking about and the general paradigm of criticism of the soviet union that's generally put forth i think that uh, this is why socialist realism or literature under stalin whatever you want to refer to it as is not really studied that much in the West because we have this paradigm of you are either a dissident or you're like a pro-regime supporter and there's basically no room in between there because people just kind of assume, well, if you wanted to criticize the government, it wasn't possible at all, so you had to become a dissident like Solzhenitsyn or you had to just blindly support the government and it's kind of silly to think about it in those terms because it, this is just an interesting look in what it can look like to criticize but still support i think uh maybe not even the government as a whole but an idea for instance and so that's kind of what i'm seeing at least here and probably will continue throughout the book especially it being the uh remastered edition if you will right yeah i mean to your point about supporting an idea not but not necessarily necessarily government one thing that's necessary to point out about grossman is of course we mentioned before that he himself was jewish his mother was killed by the nazis she was she was not evacuated um he grossman did evacuate and to go join the army and he insisted his mother came but she he was never able to convince her um and as a result uh, of her staying she was uh, overtaken when the nazis captured their town and was was killed by them and that is by all indications something that haunted Grossman for the rest of his life that he not only you know was he was not only was he was he Jewish in a country which does not recognize did not at the time recognize the uh, inordinate sacrifice of of Jewish people during the war but it's someone who his own family had been so deeply affected well it's even worse because it's not like they just didn't recognize that but they also actively targeted Grossman in yes. anti-semitic campaigns which was pretty terrible yeah and in grossman himself uh he was uh one of the one of the two authors of the the black book which was a uh a work which documented nazi atrocities against jewish people which was uh, not published in the ussr because well yeah <laughs> very a variety of reasons but basically it comes down to anti-semitism more or less uh anti-semitism in a lot more words Basically. So Grossman was someone who was deeply engaged in, in such issues and deeply concerned about it, uh, but was also kind of simultaneously suppressed. And he's someone who is able to, for someone who was so suppressed by his own government, captures a lot of humanity in, in the system that he comes from um, and the people he worked with, which is, I think, which is, again, I know I've been saying this a lot, but it is remarkable. And I've been enjoying it a great deal. Yeah, it wasn't even just oppression from 
the government directly, but also from the literary environment mm. on, on the whole. There was literally, I didn't realize this. This was, uh, thank you again, Robert Chandler, for pointing this out in the introduction. This argument that's going on, I have it on page 99 of this edition that we're reading from on the two truths, which immediately struck me as important. And it turns out it was literally a paraphrase of Gorky's criticism to Grossman <laughs> in his early years uh, when when Grossman was accused of being kind of revolutionary. And Gorky said, well, there's two truths. And the, the passage from the book goes, how many times do I have to tell you that there are two truths? There's the truth of the reality forced on us by the accursed past. And there's the truth of the reality that will defeat the past. It's the second truth, the truth of the future that I want to live by. And it's it's kind of something I feel like that Stalingrad is really grappling with, which is to say, how can you get to the future without acknowledging the past or the present? And it's 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 interesting. I think there's a lot of this two truths. There's the conversation about two worlds that are somewhat Tolstoyan, but also it takes on a completely new meaning that I'm not sure Tolstoy had envisioned. Yeah, and that 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 uh, that conversation about two truths is also, I think, I forget who brings it up, but I want to say it's Sofia Osipovna, which which opposes this idea of two truths, and she does it strongly, and she does it repeatedly mm. uh, mm-hmm. throughout the book, opposing this idea that there can be two truths, and basically saying you're going to lose sight of 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 any truth at all if you keep trying to admit this to yourself, um, and if you are inclined to agree with her, you will. Um, <laughs> Which again is, I think, mm-hmm. a testament to the to the genuine in, in, internal reality of each of these characters that it's not just disagreement for the sake of well, you know, not everyone's the same, but you truly understand everyone's perspective on where they where they come to the, each of these, why they why they fall differently on different issues like this. Yeah, I got a lot of quotes and a lot of notes, which, if you're a wonderful patron of ours, you're going to start seeing these again more regularly, because I've been kind of slacking and kind of bad bad boy (laughs) but i have them scheduled already weeks ahead of time for you when this episode releases you will have them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all my notes all my quotes you will have them it'll be good i'm looking forward to it you will soon seem like a literary genius (laughs) i don't know there's at this point there's obviously we're only at one part out of ten there will be a lot more to say yeah there's if you have not if you do not have this book Look in our show notes. We'll get some links uh, for you can acquire it. It is a an excellent book and easily, easily some of my favorite prose. I mean, I I know I'm prone to like over exaggerating, but I I love the prose so far. It, this is such good prose. It's drawn me in. It this is this is I felt so energized reading this. Um, so I'm excited to continue. I know I'm I'm looking forward to. I at first I was like, wow, we're gonna do. 10 parts of Stalingrad that's crazy it's how we're gonna do like 10 parts and I'm like oh my god should we have done 20 I don't know <laughs> in the future we're looking at doing war and peace but what if instead of doing that we just did Stalingrad and went straight to life and fade we just might <laughs> we'll see or we'll 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 satisfy our 19th century audience by doing war and peace and then we'll go right back to life and fade could be fun could be cool could be good but only our patrons will have the final say so yeah this has been good uh, Matt I gotta ask you before we head out, and uh, we've covered a lot of good stuff today, uh, but how, on a scale of one to Yeltsin, how drunk are you? I am a 10. 10, which, nice. But that's not that high, because on a scale to Yeltsin, that's like not even halfway. <laughs> I... <laughs> yeah, everything's the scale is one drunk. to 10, it's not. It's one to Yeltsin, and whatever the numbers between there are, that's up to you. Exactly. Yeah, I would say 10's not even halfway at this point for me. <laughs> but it's not just the whiskey I'm drinking... I'm drunk on prose, Cameron. Mm. I'm drunk on prose. That's, that's beautiful. I love that. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> How about you? I am. I've been drinking. These These uh, Imperial IPAs are, uh, I want to say, 7% each? Eight points. Oh, wow. 8.7%. Uh, and I'm on my third <laughs> one. So I'm actually, I'm a good, on a scale of one to Yeltsin, I'm a good seven. Okay. okay. Um, I think your 10 is maybe a little bit more metaphorical. It is. This was an is. entirely unmetaphorical seven. Sure. I, sure yeah, sure. if I drink one more of these, I'd be incoherent. Perfect. So we'll see. We'll see about that. But, Matt, I know this is probably a little obvious to our audience, but I still have to ask, but it's part of our script, what are we reading next episode? Let me decide. <laughs> On air. 
right now <laughs> just okay. throw something out so next episode we're going to be doing part two of stalingrad and that is going to be that's i, I wasn't checking that it was part two i was checking to see what chapter number is going to be we're going to be reading through a chapter 35 which is page 202 in the robert and elizabeth chandler copy that we're reading from all links to that are of course always on our website if you want to support the show we have some affiliate links that you can buy and we'll scrounge together like 50 cents from each book that we refer you to <laughs> and then we'll become insanely rich mm-hmm. 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 or something like that something happens like that i think hasn't happened yet but that's what the youtube videos tell me will happen you just get the 50 yes. cents and then you yes. invest and then you suddenly you're rich yes correct <laughs> <laughs> well matt i have to ask you what are we reading next time? Maybe I should change this phrasing because that's going to be the same for a while. What cage, what cage should we put our readers in for the next nine episodes? Well, uh, you're going to be in, in the same one. That is to say the Stalingrad one uh, where we're going to be doing uh, our part two. Uh, not the books part two, our own part two that we've made up. <laughs> uh, do you happen to know what chapters those are? <laughs> Yes, that's going to be chapters 20 through 34. Beautiful. I have lost track, even though I'm the one that sets the pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Well, so this is, I mean, our, it seems like a long series, but this is, of course, Grossman was trying to give the readers the sense of what it was like to be at Stalingrad through a human perspective. This is our attempt by putting you in the siege of our podcast mm-hmm. <laughs> for, mm-hmm. the next, for, the ne- for the next nine episodes. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Yeah. You better come along. And <laughs> You should. You should. And, of course, we can't do it. We should all become Grossman Scholars. Yeah, you, after listening to this, you basically are a Grossman Scholar, so <laughs> you're welcome, first of all. Yep. The sum total of, of, of Grossman in popular culture is like, yeah, Grossman, he wrote Life and Fate. That's the greatest novel of World War II that no one read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and now you can also read a novel that no one's read. That's awesome. But you'll get mad <laughs> respect for it. Even fewer people have read than, than Life and Fate. Yeah. It's going to be good. You'll thank us one day probably anyways maybe maybe uh we couldn't do it without the support of all of our patrons that we've got if you're interested in tossing us a few bucks each month to help keep the show running take a look over at patreon.com slash tipsy tolstoy we got we got so many beautiful patrons now we got uh jeff madeline ann janice daniel darren daniel jack page jesse lou larkin irini brandon allison cole elise mysterious donor dude joanne yitza alex stephanie julie eli caitlin brett isaac austin zachary pack rob maya sharon and emily again if you're interested in helping out the show take a look over at patreon.com slash tipsy story because podcasting doesn't pay very well grad school doesn't pay very well why do none of my things that I like pay very well? That's really unfortunate. But <laughs> hey, you could help pay us marginally okay. So you can give it all to an editor. <laughs> so that we can give it all to an editor. There you go. And then go back to continuing to produce content for free. Hell yeah. Well, the music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.